for finding signal in the noise, how to put big data to use. Uh, for any of you uh, who are wondering what that graph is, it's my LinkedIn social graph. Uh, you can generate yours if you go to LinkedInLabs.com. You can generate a similar graph for your LinkedIn profile. Uh, so, uh, how many of you here are familiar with machine learning or natural language processing? How many of you have used it in school or at work? Okay, fair number. Uh, so I learned machine learning uh, when I went to college in US and uh, it was really funny. Uh, the sense that uh, it involved a lot of linear algebra, a lot of calculus, a lot of probability distributions, and it was all very mathematical and very boring for me. So I thought maybe this is my chance to you know, set it right, maybe we can make it a little more fun. Uh, so what we will do here is we will take two different problems from two different disciplines and try to see if we can find, uh, if we can solve, you know, take a stab at solving those problems. So the first problem is obviously astronomy. What we want to do is find areas. Okay. Uh, so uh, for both these problems, we will try to answer three questions. Is it a big data problem? And what are the questions we are trying to get answers from? Uh, you know, what kind of answers we want from this big data, right? And what kind of techniques we can use to get those answers? So the first problem is you want to find aliens or you know uh, habitable habitable planets. So let's say uh, we have got data. Uh, Hubble telescope was launched in 1990 uh, and it generates close to 1 lakh measurements per second. So that has been two decades. So you can do the math of how many measurements it has done since then. So if you take that kind of data uh, or if you look at the stats here, just our own galaxy has close to you know anywhere from 100 to 300 billion stars. If you take that kind of data, it uh, does it fit our criteria? Is it a big data problem? Yes. Uh, what is it that we are trying to answer here? We are trying to find habitable planets, right? So the very first thing we have to get uh, to get to that, we have to answer is how many uh, stars there are, how many galaxies there are, how many planets there are. The way to get to habitable planets, you first have to find galaxies. To get to galaxies, uh, once you uh, figure out all the galaxies, you have to find a star in that galaxy that is similar to sun. Once you figure out that you have found a star that is similar to sun, then you have to figure out if there are planets orbiting it. And once you have found a planet that is orbiting it, all you have to do is figure out whether there is water and carbon on it. Once you have done that, you have found a habitable planet. So uh, it is very, very simple problem when broken down. So uh, what we'll do is we, I don't think we can, uh, in the next 20 minutes we can find aliens, but we can, you know, sites our sites lower and we can find the galaxies. Let's say we want to find all the galaxies. So this is the first problem that we want to solve. Uh, the second problem we want to solve is uh, we want to figure out the collective consciousness of what's happening. So you have all heard the stats, 900 million people on Facebook, uh, 300 to 400 million people on Twitter, uh, you know, similar numbers on YouTube. And uh, we all know there is a lot of data being generated online today than, you know, uh, a few years back. So, uh, so what you want to find out is what are people talking and sharing and what's happening in the world based on all the conversations that's happening anywhere on the web. Now, uh, again, it's a very interesting problem. Uh, I think uh, uh, the only three companies that can analyze this scale of data today are Facebook, Twitter, and Google, because they have access to this data. So uh, again, we have to you know, lower our sites, and we'll try to find, given a topic, we'll try to find 
what is what are people saying about that particular topic in real time right so you want to figure out whether they are you know uh, talking positive or negative about that topic what kind of uh, you know what kind of issues they are bringing around that topic those kind of things so now we have two problems from two different disciplines one is also on the friend of a friend problem so anybody who has used facebook or twitter today knows that you know uh, when you log into twitter or facebook you get recommendations so if you and i have 10 mutual friends they'll recommend your name right so uh, turns out it's a age old problem it's something that came from astronomy uh, in astronomy when you are trying to find galaxies what you want to do is figure out which stars are friends of each other stars and then you can use transitivity if a is friend of b and b is friend of c then possibility a and c are also in the same cluster or in the same galaxy right uh, whereas what we want to do with the uh, social networking problem is what we want to do we want to make it possible to do real time text analytics so that we can analyze what what people are saying and uh, provide some kind of a summary so that people can make educated guesses about what uh, you know uh, what people opinion on a certain topic so uh, now let's jump back to machine learning uh, so in machine learning there are two important concepts uh, clustering and classification uh, clustering is more about discovery clustering is more about given a set of data points you want to group them and figure out which data points are related to each other and the deal with clustering is you might not know what those clusters are you might in some cases you might know the number of clusters but you might not know what those clusters are whereas in classification you have a set of predefined classes and you want to figure out given a set of data points which data points belong to which class right now classification again you can have supervised classification algorithms and unsupervised classification algorithms uh, we will not go into details on that but for you know supervised algorithms what you would have to do is you have to train uh, you have to train your algorithm uh, on a set of data data points and based on that it learns the patterns underlying those data points and based on those patterns it tries to classify new data points as they come in so let's look at a clustering algorithm so this is uh, called k-means clustering algorithm so if you look at it uh, the very first graph has a set of uh, data points plotted on a two dimensional surface and what we are trying to find out uh, is what are those clusters so uh, in a, a k-means clustering algorithm you can make the assumption uh, that you already know the number of clusters so let's say we know that there are two clusters here so the way you would go about doing it is you would pick two arbitrary points data points in uh, out of all those data points and assume them to be the centroid of that cluster okay uh, so that's what's happening in the first uh, first graph in the second graph then you try to uh, bring together all the data points that are near to that centroid data point okay so uh, that's what you see happening in uh, step 2 and 3 that is trying to uh, color code them into uh, into that centroid color uh, to group them together and every time you do that you recompute the centroid and when you do this enough and when the data starts to converge what you get is two clusters uh, which can uh, which represent a uh, set of data points so uh, to solve the friend of a friend problem in case of our galaxy uh, uh, trying to figure out the galaxies we can use a clustering algorithm like this 
So what happens is, uh, given uh, given a set of uh, data points where the data is data points are nothing but the location of the stars uh, on a two-dimensional map, you figure out the distance between two stars, and uh, if you make the assumption that there are certain number of galaxies in that uh, two-dimensional space, then you can start clustering around those and figure out which stars belong to which galaxy. So I'll just go back a second here. So the galaxy in the background you see is Andromeda galaxy. Now typically, uh, most of the time when you see a picture of a galaxy, it's usually you know artificially colored to look this way. It doesn't look this way, it just looks uh, like a bunch of dots on a on a black plane, right? So, uh, to uh, to differentiate from the nearby stars, they basically uh, all this uh, astrophysicists they color it so that you can actually figure out that it's a galaxy. But otherwise, there is no uh, good way of knowing that this this constitutes a galaxy. Okay. Now we we'll jump to uh, classification algorithms. So I think uh, 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 Venkata just before we talked about decision trees. So uh, decision trees are very, very popular and one of the most used classification algorithms. And I think we have all used it uh, uh, internally. Uh, you know, uh, trying to you know trying to make choices or decisions based on available options. So uh, the the fundamental part in, in case of decision trees is you basically have some kind of a flow chart and for each decision you make along the way, uh, you have something called information gain. So what that means is uh, at each level, you want to make a decision based on uh, based on a data point that will give you the maximum information gain. We will talk about one more uh, classification algorithm which is quite popular called support vector machines. So again, we have a two dimensional space with a bunch of data points uh, strewn in. Uh, what I want to really want you to look at is the bottom uh, left, uh, bottom left uh, charts. So on the left, we have a bunch of data points on a single dimensional plane. It's on a line. You, you can see the green and red dots on a line. Now what we want to do is we know that these data points uh, belong to two different classes. One belongs to the green class and the others belong to the red class. Now the trick here is there is no good way of segmenting uh, or figuring out a mathematical formula to classify new data points based on a single dimensional plane. So what you do and this is one of the neat tricks of support vector machines is you project them in a higher dimensional space. So the graph right next to that is project in the same data points projected into a two dimensional space. So what you got there is you found a huge elliptical shape and now you can find a plane that separates those two data points. Once you find a plane that separates the two data points, what you have found is a mathematical function that will allow you to classify uh, given, a set, given a new set of data points, you can easily uh, apply that mathematical function to classify it into green or red uh, class. Uh, so one of the things uh, uh, we do is uh, we are talking about uh, we are talking about the real time text analytics problem. Uh, so what we want to do here is analyze what people are saying about any topic. And uh, turns out that's what I do for a living. I run a startup called Vivon. So we basically do real time social analytics. So as you can see here, uh, one of our customers is actually monitoring uh, uh, the LHC experiment that just ended a few weeks back, uh, Higgs boson particle was formed. And as you can see, this is the real time feed of what people are saying about that 
specific topic online. Uh, with that, I would like to end. Is there, are there any other questions I can answer or yeah? Sure. So you choose the uh, you choose the uh, okay. Yeah. And what did you you basically apply non non linear transformation so that it becomes analog. On similar data side, how will you apply clustering? Will you apply uh um gaming algorithm? Will you apply non linear transformation there also or how will how will it generate the clusters? Uh, so clustering would be tricky there. Uh, you would have to apply nonlinear transformation uh, to generate clusters because otherwise greens would be separate clusters uh, on a single dimensional plane. So you would have to apply nonlinear transformation. Necessarily, you if you understand the data set really well, what the characteristics of the data set is, what the feature vectors are, then you can possibly figure out if uh, if it requires a nonlinear transformation. So it needs some domain knowledge. Yes. Uh, which are the <coughs> popular tools? Uh, and yeah. Uh, which are the tools uh, that you use uh, generally? Uh, so I think there are lots of open source libraries, there is Veka, which is a open source machine learning library, there is Mahavar, which is which sits on top of Hadoop and which pretty much does lots of uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, and I think there are lots of other open source libraries from universities uh, that you could leverage. So my question is, uh, except with the exception of uh, Mahavar, uh, the other uh, packages that are there, how well do they scale with increasing memory? Uh, so, from practical experience, uh, you require a lot of tweaking those open source libraries to scale it to uh, to scale it to uh, large scale data usage. For example, we process a terabyte of data a month uh, for our customers and it turns out most of these libraries don't work out of the box for us. So, what we have ended up doing is writing our own algorithms. Right. So again, with the exception of Mahut, uh, do you know of any even single library which has something like say a simple support vector classifier, which can be deployed on a map reuse kind of a paper? Uh, as far as my knowledge goes, there isn't any. There is libsvm. Uh, again, you have to write wrappers on top of that to you know uh, uh, to work with map reuse. Hi, uh, this is regarding the real-time analysis on the Facebook and Twitter data. So, uh, what sort of uh, Facebook data do you analyze? Uh, because there are a lot of privacy issues in Twitter, it's okay for me. Uh, but when it comes to real-time data analysis on Facebook, what do you do? Uh, so, uh, we analyze a lot of uh, fan page data. So, you know, fan page conversations are public. So, if, if a business has a fan page on Facebook, most of those conversations are public. And frankly, you'll be surprised at how much of uh, the wall conversations are public, especially in the age group 10 to 20. Uh, the younger generation, I think, is more open and more willing to share data with the world. Or is it they don't know to <laughs> Maybe that's another okay. So one more question. So do you do any demand sensing sort of a thing uh, on this real time analysis? I'm sorry, what's demand sensing? So uh, yeah. So in fact, uh, what you're talking about is lead generation, right? Sort of lead generation. Right. So we actually wrote algorithms, machine learning algorithms that could classify leads, and it's quite funny. Uh, so we were trying to track. Uh, you know, people who wanted to buy luxury cars. Turns out, people between age 10 to 20 tweet a lot about that, that them wanting to buy BMW, right? And most of them are students. So, it's 
very difficult. You know, you need to understand the context. It's aspirational or is it a real need? You know, people who want to buy BMW, would they tweet about it? Right? So this is just one example. But uh, to drive on the point, I think the fact is that uh, trying to identify intent of purchase from conversations is a very, very difficult task. I mean, we try to do sentiment analysis and that itself is very difficult. Uh, people say all sorts of things, you know, I am bored with a smiley. Would you classify that as positive or negative, right? So, it's very, very interesting data, but it's very, very difficult to analyze. Uh, you talked about analyzing Facebook data. Yeah, you talked about analyzing Facebook data. So, whatever analysis that you do, how different is it than what Facebook Insight provides? Uh, so, we do sentiment analysis, like I just mentioned. So, whether people yeah. are talking positive or negative about the program. We also do text analytics. So, we try to bubble up the topics that people care about uh, when they talk about the, you know, your brand. And we also try to uh, uh, give an overall picture, so it's not just Facebook, we get your data from Twitter, from blogs, from review websites, from everywhere. So it's a, it's a comprehensive view of what's happening, you know, with your brand. Okay, is, it, is it after the fact or near to real time kind of uh, analysis? Uh, yeah, so it's near to real time. We have a latency of uh, 5 minutes with respect to Twitter and Facebook and 30 minutes with respect to blogs and other websites. Hi, oh yeah. Uh, thank you for presenting. Uh, do you use any specific tools for uh, text analysis or yeah, sentiment analysis? Uh, we have our own uh, homegrown algorithms for sentiment. Uh, for text analytics, we use uh, a bunch of uh, natural language processing parsers, so which help us in parsing. Uh, Passing text and trying to understand the syntactic structure behind the text. Are there any uh, open source uh, tools or something? Uh, I think if you want it for commercial use, you still have to license it. But there is Stanford parser, which is quite popular. Uh, there used to be a parser from Palo Alto Research Center Park, but I think now it's exclusively licensed to Microsoft. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. I know the last few questions, but I just wanted to know. You mentioned that identifying the intent of the message in terms of conversation or whether the guy wants to buy a car or something like that, it's difficult. So how would you rate the analysis of the semantic engine that you guys have been building around? Because you mentioned that some, uh, statement like, I'm bored with a smiley, that itself is difficult. So how exactly do you define algorithms to track such uh, rules that come out of regular conversations? Uh, I believe my question uh, is clear. Uh, so what you are asking is, how do you ensure that you are doing good analysis or right analysis given how tricky the data is? So I think that's a constant challenge. Uh, we always try to keep up with it. We always try to... Uh, uh, so we use a lot of supervised learning algorithms. So we always try to train with more and more data. So I'll give you one example. Uh, machine translation. So, you know, translating from English to Arabic or English to Chinese was a big challenge. And uh, there were companies which used to spend millions of dollars trying to perfect those techniques, you know, trying to get that 0.1% increase in, in the accuracy of translation. And then one fine day Google came along and they changed the game. What they did was that through so much data I did, so much training data I did, that they basically knew all of the other guys out of water, right? So they took the 200 GB corpus of United Nations. So United Nations Charter is translated into 193 languages, if I'm not wrong. So they took that corpus and they used MapReduce to train on that corpus. Right. So. Uh, so, 
there are two things we do there. Uh, one is we constantly refine our algorithms. The second thing we do is, I think, uh, again, I'll refer back to uh, the active learning that Venkata was talking about. Uh, so we do a lot of active learning. So let's say uh, you are one of our customers and you find that the system rated a conversation with the wrong sentiment. You can go and override it. And once you override it, the system learns from your input. Uh, no, if you are retraining the data all the time, then you can definitely take that into account. Exactly. So uh, what we do is we retrain every month rather than every day. Uh, 